Welcome, everyone. We are truly grateful that you're here with us. I'm Ashley, a writer at the Vasculitis Foundation, and um, really appreciative that we're joined by Jan and Darren today. Um, so Jan and Darren are living with vasculitis, and they're what we're calling flying solo. Um, so navigating vasculitis and life without a partner. And so that's what we're all here to discuss today, um, to talk about uh, their experience with that and uh, how how they've navigated that. Um, of course, we're, we're not promising, uh, they're, they're not expected to be experts here, but just to share their experience, and I hope you get involved too. We've got the chat open, so if you want to go ahead and as they're talking, if you relate to something or you have something to add, please feel free to add that to the chat. Um, at the end of our discussion, um, Jan and Darren will also be taking questions. So at, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little like quotation boxes and it says Q&A. So if you have questions anytime throughout this uh, webinar, you can go ahead and click the Q&A box and put your question in there. And we'll do our best to answer as many as we can at the end. Um, so we'll, we'll chat for a little bit and then take some questions. Um, but to get started, I'm just gonna invite, uh, I guess, Darren first, you wanna introduce yourself and uh, share a little bit about you? Sure. Uh, so my name is Darren White, uh, I'm in, Dreary, Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada. Um, I was diagnosed with uh, GPA vasculitis in August of 2022 after being symptomatic for about 16, 18 months. Um, it's hard to say exactly. Um, I do work. I'm a human rights officer here in Nova Scotia. Um, very rewarding kind of work and end up doing a lot of work with people um, experiencing problems with employers um, in terms of disabilities, not always vasculitis, but it's an interesting tie-in for me. Uh, thanks, Darren. Jan, do you want to share? Sure. Hi. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jan Engel. I have giant cell arteritis and fibromuscular dysplasia, and I was diagnosed in September of 2022 I've been in remission since November of 2023. Um, my symptoms first started, I would say around January, 2021. Um, I, could, I could barely roll over in bed without being in excruciating pain. I, I could not walk and I had to leave the job I was at and replace myself. Um, and oh, and I, I work in an industry where um, you're it's uh, <laughs> I work in an industry where you 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 need to you need to always be healthy so it's it's been a little bit interesting that way <laughs> so to dive in our, into our first topic of conversation I want to talk about managing doctor's appointments and Jan I'll start with you going back to that time when you just mentioned when you were diagnosed and when we had talked before this you have you had said that like at the beginning you have so many doctor's appointments Vasculitis is new for most people who are diagnosed with it. They've never even heard of it before. So you're probably swirling in terminology you don't know, and it can feel overwhelming. Can you just take us back to that time and talk a little bit about what that was like? Um, yeah, yes. And um, at that time, um, on top of the uh, appointments, um, it I, I was I work where it's just like you're you're not expected to to take a lot of time off for appointments. Um, so realizing that I needed to, you know, advocate for myself and and get there, you know, regardless, <laughs> um, took just you know, reexamining that and um, and when I had an appointment, I needed I needed to go and um, it the whole thing was it was a bit. <laughs> It was a bit, it was a bit much and it's a bit scary. Yeah, we're gonna get into that more about how you talk to your employers about that, if they're understanding. Um, like you said, when you're, you have doctor's appointments for vasculitis, you need to go. Um, Darren, you, you had said that, you know, you really have to be on in a doctor's appointment when you're by yourself, when you don't have a spouse, partner, whomever with you to kind of be a second set of listening ears. Um, how do you navigate that? How do you show up and make sure that you're communicating the best that you can with doctors and taking in the information? 
Yeah. So, you know, that's a great question because it is, it can be exhausting. You know, sometimes you're in the height of medications or disease and you're meant to show up at this doctor's appointment and give a an accurate recounting of what your past month or weeks have been like um, and try to absorb the things that are coming at you in terms of next treatment steps. So what I ended up doing is uh, I started actually taking my laptop right in with me, <laughs> sitting down, opening it up. And then I had my questions all sort of pre-typed with spaces. And, and as they were saying things, I'd be sort of typing answers in. My handwriting is terrible, so that's not really a, a note-taking option for me. Um, but I found that really started to help, and I think it helped for two reasons. First off, I think it increased the accountability for the doctor a little bit because she knew I was actually going to write down and then remember what she'd said and be able to bring it up. And it really helped me because, you know, the day after the appointment, you've been in that room for half an hour or an hour. Lots was said, but there's no way I'm going to remember it all. So I'd have these notes to review back from. And now that it's what, uh, I guess it'll be two years in August, you know, now I have this running sort of dialogue of all of these appointments with rheumatology, um, which are the key ones for me. Um, and, you know, a little bit of other specialists in there too. So that's, that's what I do. Yeah. And Jan, I see you were nodding your head. Do you do something similar? Or do you have other ways to navigate those appointments? I do. Uh, and I still have those uh, journals, um, the, the written, the calendars and the journals where I wrote down the appointment, you know, what the doctor said, um, my uh, UCLA the help the hospital that I'm with. They also, they also keep, you know, all the notes and everything on file. So I can go back and, and check them when I need to. But I still keep the calendars and the appointments and what was said and um, as a record. Yeah, that's great. And I love that you have them. So whenever, if there's another point later when you need them, you can go back to it. Uh, I want to talk about what you had started bringing up earlier, navigating or negotiating this with your employer. So Jan, are you open with your employers about your health situation? Um, I, I am. I am now. Um, at the beginning, um, it, it's it's interesting because you you always find out who your who your friends are and um, who's got your back. Um, I was lucky in that um, uh, some of the co as it was it was early on. Um, I had uh, some coworkers who were just you know um, very supportive, very understanding. Um, there's, there's one in particular when, uh, during the, during the scariest time in 2021, when I was going through all the tests, a lot of MRAs, MRIs, a lot of ultrasounds and, um, people meaning well would say, you know, hope you feel better. Um, which wasn't exactly what I wanted to hear at the time, at the time. And I had one coworker and, um, it was right after my diagnosis. And he and I had just texted him and um, he told me, he said he, there was a long silence on his end of the phone. And he said, you know what, um, let me know. I'm going to call you or you call me after you have this next appointment and let me know what happened. And to me, that was everything that was that was the support I needed. And um, and he still every he still every every few months is ch sending me a text, checking in. How am I doing? that kind of thing. And when you've had situations like at the beginning when you had a lot of doctor's appointments and you were having to leave when you're in an industry where you really can't do that or it's not expected that you do that, what did you do to help manage that or work with your employers? Um, well, I did have one at the beginning who, had, you know, he was like, well, why are you going to go get another blood test? Do you just, you know, and I said, well, because my doctor needs to have it now. Um, and I fortunately had the support of another coworker who said, you got to go. The doctor needs this. You got to go. And I'm glad I listened to her. I got a speeding ticket on the way because I was late <laughs> for that appointment. Um, and later, once he realized that this was really serious, because I was having to leave this job, um, he was more supportive after, but 
And that also reminds me later, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about self-care for you because it sounds like it's incredibly stressful. You're trying, you know, you need to hold down a job. They're not understanding. Maybe on the surface, you visibly look fine. So people don't understand how serious this is. Um, <laughs> you're speeding in order to get to the appointment. So, so we'll talk about what you both do to support yourselves through that. Um, Darren, talk about your experience. I believe you've been able to be open with your employers. Yeah, so uh, I actually have two jobs right now. My full-time permanent position is with the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, and I'm doing that extended term at Human Rights. With both employers, they were both very accommodating um, and very understanding, which was such a weight off my shoulders, um, particularly when I was first diagnosed and on the high-dose prednisone. Uh, I think probably everyone in this room knows what it's like to be on high-dose prednisone. It's no fun. And when you're trying to do a job that requires legal analysis, it's not just going to be not only did it not work out well, it, it could have had negative consequences. So they actually allowed me to change what I was doing for that period of time, still supporting the workplace and the team, but not focusing on these tricky legal files. And then as the prednisone was reduced and I started to recover, um, I was able to return to those duties. Even as I say that though, I'm in the process of trying to make some of what for me are still temporary accommodations, permanent accommodations. And so my employer outsources that to a third party and they've given me some documents to take to my next rheumatology appointment, which is tomorrow. And these documents are entirely for someone who, you know, strained their back or sprained their ankle. They, they don't suit this kind of condition. So I'm going to have some very interesting conversations tomorrow with my rheumatologist as we try to figure out what what on earth do we put in these spaces? You know, it's not a matter of can I, you know, lift five pounds over my head. That's that's not the issue. Right. So so things have been pretty good for me, but but there's still challenges and and there's opportunities, I guess, for advocacy. Yeah, you mentioned like being on steroids and feeling like perhaps you couldn't do your job in the same to the same capacity. Or I know you've had hospitaliz hospitalization. How do you prepare with your employers for something like that when you might unexpectedly either have to be out for a long time or just have days where like I don't know the afternoon you're just like I am exhausted or whatever it might be and I feel like I can't do this job. Well, again, and I think I'm very lucky. I don't think a lot of people have the same experience that I do. So my employer, particularly my manager, is very understanding that it's my goal to work and it's my goal to give the Human Rights Commission my best. That may mean that on some days I'm not performing at the best, but on other days I'll make up for it. And that's I've been able to sort of prove that in my output so they're comfortable with it. I can imagine that other employers would not be very comfortable with, with the ability to just let a staff member sort of flex their own time. In terms of hospitalizations, you know, I can give a current example. So I do files based on systemic discrimination, which means it's not just one file, it's a group of files all with the same employer or place. And I have deadlines stretching from June through to November to present these stacks of systemic discrimination files to the Board of Commissioners. But I've made very careful to let my boss know that that's assuming my health holds. Mm -hmm. That's assuming there's no hospitalizations. And she's good for that. Even so, we have the conversation and then I document it in an email mm -hmm. just, just to be safe. Yeah, I love that you mentioned documenting it too after the conversation so that you know. Um, Jan, I don't know if I have this right. So with your job, when you have sort of, it seems like different jobs, like uh, um, do you have a different boss or supervisor each time? Like when you I do, product? I do, I do. And um, I have been lucky in that um, ever since, uh, you know, the very early, early in January, 2021, when, you know, it was like, what on earth is going on? Mm -hmm. um, and ever since then, when I've ex explained to each 
uh, supervisor and boss what's going on. I have had nothing but a complete understanding and support um, to the point where when, you know, when I've had had to go in for an MRI, I was told, oh, well, you know, it's okay. Take the rest of the day off if you're tired and the blood work and everything. And I was like, no, I'm fine. You know, I'll, I'm, I'll just keep going. But um, I have been, I've been really lucky and they, they still check up on me um, from each, you know, project and everything. So I've been, I've been lucky that way. Do you have any advice for when you have to have that conversation with a new employer or supervisor each time? Like what might be helpful to say to them to help them be more understanding? What I've always done is, is I just try to, to uh, be, be direct um, and be really honest. Um, and, you know, when I was, when I was going on prednisone, I not only told the, my staff, my crew, because I was supervising crew, but also um, some of the other departments, their keys that I was going to have to, that I was going to be on prednisone and to let me know if I get cranky or I'm wound up, just, just let me know. And, um, uh, and I also, you know, was re really kept an eye on, you know, making sure that I stayed as even as possible. And I found out when I was direct, you know, and um, with everyone, they got it. Cause then they felt like, you know, they knew what was going on. And so, um, and it worked, worked for me. Yeah, I love that, that you said, just be direct, honest, so people sort of have joint expectations of, of what could happen. Um, if people have more questions about employment and perhaps we'll come back to it later, please put them in the q and I'm just gonna shift topics for now. Um, so Darren, you are a single dad of two, is it two kids? Yeah, um, and you had said something to me about this fine balance between um, wanting to inform your kids and also knowing that they're not like your care providers or your partner. Talk about balancing that line and just generally um, parenting with vasculitis. And your, your kids are, maybe you can give their ages, they're, they're older. Yeah, they're, they're older. They're uh, Gen Z, which means they're still here. Um, <laughs> they're, they're 18 and 21 in June. Um, and they're great and they, they're fantastic. Um, you know, it's been me and them for many years. So we kind of have our routines established for mm -hmm. housework and stuff like that. Because of the disease, um, you know, my fatigue is higher. My joint pain is kind of higher. Lost some hearing. So it changed things. Um, and I don't want their young adulthood to be about having a sick dad. And they've had to live through some pretty scary moments last summer when I was in the hospital, like once and then again. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were they were troopers. But I also, you know, yeah, I just I don't want my disease to inform their their initial years of adulthood. So, well, absolutely, I asked them for help, and I, like any dad, have to remind them of their obligations to the household and please pitch in and stuff like that. I try to make it not about me, just more about, hey, you know, we're now like three big bodies living in this household and we all need to pitch in. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is a, a hard balance because, you know, I, I'm a human too, and it's nice to get support from people around. Um, so that's that's the line, right? Not making them my caregivers making sure they know it's important to help. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, that's great. And I feel like that's just good human lesson <laughs> for them, like to, to support each other. Um, Bonnie in the chat had mentioned that she hasn't told her 20 year old child's daughter. Um, do you have any advice for having that conversation? I know everyone- Yeah, but, but that's, but can you hear me? Oh yeah, go ahead, Bonnie. But that's very, there's a reason for that. Prior to this, happen, she's away at college and I've had a lung condition for a number of years, and she knows that I have, I'm immunocompromised because of my lungs. And I was just in the hospital, I was, before this all happened, I was in the hospital for something, and she came home Thanksgiving when I was in the hospital, which at that point was still, we thought, lung connected. So when we learned I had this instead, which in fact has made my lungs much better, but that I now had this other thing, 
I, she has not been informed yet details because we just thought it's just too much. Like she already knows I have an illness. She knows I'm on a restricted. She knows there's some comp complications going on with my kidneys, but she doesn't really know about this new disease. And my ex, we both and the doctors just decide there's really no, it didn't make sense to tell her that now because she's already carrying the other burden. So it's a mm -hmm. it's slightly different than his just because she's already been carrying this one disease. So that's why I'm just not sure if I want to tell her. Yeah. And I t and totally respect that and, and not saying that you should change what you're doing. Um, I'm just curious, maybe Darren, do you have any thoughts about almost like that burden or the fear that um, kids might have to carry knowing that their parent has vasculitis, like how you approach that with them? Yeah. You know, that was, that was a tough one. Um, but at the same time for me, um, you know, my GPA has responded somewhat to treatment, but it doesn't seem like I'm one of those people that's ever going to experience this idea of remission, which is different for everybody, um, which is fine. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm ink positive with the PR3, which makes it more likely for relapse. And I've had these kind of pretty substantial complications. Um, so, you know, my thinking behind telling them was that, you know, I need them to know what's happening so that I'm not trying to explain from a hospital bed or worse, you know, somebody who knows me is trying to explain to them while I'm in a hospital bed. Uh, so uh, my oldest in particular has some anxiety issues. And we always found that with her, um, you know, information actually helped quell the anxiety rather than increase the anxiety. So she'd get anxious when she was younger about some unknown and we'd actually combat that with information. So kind of by making her kind of fully aware of what's going on and which meds I have, that actually for her provides her more comfort than if she knew that I was somehow sick but unsure why or what. And uh, Deb is also asking, um, how do your children feel about, I guess, the public support for the vascular community that you're public about your experience? Well, you know, I uh, I raised a couple of little, little social warriors, so <laughs> they have their own causes that they're pretty uh, out and loud about. And, uh, and if anything, I'm taking lessons from their bravery. Yeah, uh, I, I, that's that's actually a completely accurate statement. I'm I'm taking lessons from their willingness to be out in public and and advocating for their own needs and their own community. Mm, I love that you did a good job. <laughs> um, the next thing that I I want to touch on is the um, like emotional support. How it can be lonely. I mean, it can be lonely navigating vasculitis to begin with, whether you have a thousand people in your corner or or one, just because it is so rare. Um, Jen, you had said something. You had told a story about buying yourself a medical bracelet. Can you tell? Can you repeat that story? Yes, I I have it on right now. <laughs> Um, I have, uh, this is actually, I was thinking about this this morning. This is probably my third, third one, because as I've, as I've gone through the, you know, what the early suspect, what they were suspecting was the diagnosis was, you know, peripheral artery disease, or if it was, you know, anemia, or I changed bracelets, um, until I got, um, the diagnosis in September, 2022. And in our support groups, which I strongly, strongly recommend, um, it came up again about needing a medical ID bracelet, which I think is an outstanding idea because then uh, someone can see right away, they can see everything in case I don't have my medical card or if I'm, you know, they also make necklaces and stuff, but um, it, it makes me feel much safer um, that that information is right there. Yeah, and you had talked about, and. Uh... I think this is a real fear amongst people. That's why it's it's a little scary, but I'm going to bring it up. You're like, your biggest fear is like, you're just going to be found somewhere. Like that fact of not having um, a partner. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, that was, um, I first, I felt that when I was, um, I was working on location in Savannah, Georgia. And 
Um, I was re having a reaction. I had been on a very high dose of prednisone. And to go along with that, they, they gave me Bactrim, which I was allergic to, and then the Tocobone, I'm allergic to a lot of medication. And I had to get myself to an ER. It was like 8 o'clock at night. I'm in a city I don't know. And um, couldn't find the entrance. Um, thank you, Siri. And uh, I was hysterical. I couldn't find it. I, I felt like I, I must have been in the back or something. I it felt like I was on an abandoned community college. And I wound up calling 911. I was hysterical because my throat was slowly closing and, I, and this rash was spreading, um, which is or the hive, which is how my body reacts to this. And and that's when I remember thinking, I am just going to be found here, laying out in the middle of this abandoned community college like thing, never made it to the ER. No one's going to know for how many days. And um, and and that's <laughs> fortunately. They called me and they, they sent somebody to help me get to the ER. So, and, and so I'm here now. But um, that's that's another reason why I think the medical bad um, ID bracelet or necklace is, is critical. Oh, I'm really glad you're here now. Um, that's <laughs> terrifying. And so, you know, going through experiences like this or even just having the fear that something like this might happen. So, Jan, you mentioned, and Darren, I know you nodded your head, like the VF support groups are an avenue for you to get emotional support and just share advice and feel understood. Do you have other avenues to feel supported? Do you have like a good group of friends or like, what do you rely on for, for that? I, 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 I actually, um, in addition to the support groups, you know, like I said earlier, you always find out who your real friends are. And I have learned that I have, real friends that I didn't know were that true of a, true of a friend before and people who I thought were my friends weren't. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know through social media on, on Twitter and Instagram, I have made a lot of close connections. And in fact, before coming on today, they're all like, you've got this, you've got this, you know, and um, these are people I've never even met in, in person, but, you know, so you know, you know, in addition to like real life friends, that, that's been another and um, source of support for me. Yeah, because those people can understand more um, what you're going through. And just a, another quick question, I going out of order into the Q&A. Uh, Vanessa wants to know, where do you get a medical bracelet? Well, the, the, I know the American Medical Association, I believe, makes some. There's an American, but th this one that I got came from Lauren's Hope, um, and they, she has different, because this is more bracelet-y, so it's something I would, you know, wear more. Um, okay, great, thank you. Um, Darren, what about you? Uh, what do you rely on for that additional support? And I was worried you were gonna ask me the same question. Um, I, I'm not great at it. Uh, you know, I was a military brat, uh, moved a lot, never developed good skills for maintaining kind of in-person friendships. Um, and the support groups have been really, they, they've been that for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now, I mean, it started as me attending the support groups with a bunch of strangers, but now I would absolutely consider them friends. And if they happen to come to Halifax, I'd expect them to come over for supper at the very least. And I think I could go visit them as well. Because there, there is a, you know, I, I do have you know, friends and acquaintances here, but none of them really understand what, mm -hmm. what having a condition is like. Um, and I try not to, I mean, there's only so much you can kind of advocate for with your own friends before you just kind of like, okay, you're not going to get it. I get that you don't get it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have my brother um, who's nearby and, and you know, he's, he's good and supportive, um, but even he doesn't necessarily completely get it. Uh, and my parents are in their 80s, so I, you know, I'm their support. <laughs> They're not my support. So yeah, so I go back again to the support group being absolutely invaluable for me. And, you know, I found out about the support groups doing kind of internet sleuthing almost as soon as I got the diagnosis. 
And then for some reason that I cannot state, I waited and waited and waited before I tried one, um, which was dumb in hindsight. I should have done it right away. And uh, I'm so glad I made that connection. Mm. Thanks, Darren. And, and uh, my colleague Jennifer had put the link to where you can find the VF support groups in the chat. So if you're not already familiar, you can go ahead and click that um, and learn about the support groups that we offer. Um, I guess, Darren, I'll, I'll stick with you for this next question. How have you prepared for a hopefully something that never happens, <laughs> although I know you it, it has happened in the past, a medical emergency? Do you have someone who can help um, make care decisions for you if you can't? Or what else might you have in place to support a situation like that? So yeah, so my brother is completely authorized to make medical decisions if I'm not able to. Um, and, and he's aware of what my choices are which is for the doctors to do everything humanly possible um, until there's absolutely nothing left to do. Um, but I, I will say this, the, the heat kit, the heat kit that you can get from the Asanophilic Rare Disease Organization, which is completely free. There are kits for all the different kinds of vasculitis. The last two times I was in the hospital, um, I didn't have that kit with me and it would have proved invaluable because, you know, these ER docs, they don't know stuff about rare diseases. I mean, not unless they're personally connected to somebody with one. And their concern is, I'm an ER doc. I need to keep this guy from dying right now. And trying to tell one of these ER docs that, hey, you know, I can tell that something is terribly wrong with me. And because of this condition, I have the potential to get very sick very fast. That mm -hmm. isn't really in their world of experience, but that heat kit has whole kind of sections on it um, that describe vasculitis and the, the conditions and concerns. So I now have one and it's beside the door. And if I have to go back to the hospital again, that thing's going with me for sure. Mm, thank you for sharing that. And again, Jennifer put the link in the chat so other people can access that. Um, so yeah, Bonnie, you'll see right above your your comment is, is the link to that. What do you um, say, a heat kit? What's a heat kit? Heat, H-E-A-T, H -E -A -T, a hospital emergency, I can't remember the exact acronym, but it's this, they, they, they send you this package of cards that are all held together by a carabiner and it has important medical information for emergency professionals. And you can also fill in your specific details and what meds you're on. And it's this tidy little package that you can bring with you to the hospital. Okay. And Darren, are they free or is there a charge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're free, as I thought. Okay. They're free. Even, even in Canada, they shipped it all the way up here for me. <laughs> That's great. Um, Jan, do you have anything you want to add for that? Add to that? We were even talking, you know, previously, like, how do you, do you prepare, like, if you need to water someone to water your plants? Or I don't know, I don't think you have a dog, I forget. Do you, do you prepare for things like that? Neighbor, or like neighbors supportive or aware of what's going on? Oh, I, I have awesome neighbors. <laughs> I only have hummingbirds. Um, to be, so the, hummingbirds. They're good. the one thing I do have, though, um, is I have a suitcase that is packed in case I need to uh, stay. And, and the reason I do that is because um, part of during the diagnosis, I thought I was going to go to my job one morning after a little eight o'clock appointment and knew I was <laughs> in the ER. So um, and I you know, didn't ha have anything. So I keep a bag in my car and I have one at home ready to go. Mm. Yeah, that's smart. Um, I was like, what was I just gonna say after this? Oh, I know. <laughs> Someone else had asked a question. Um, do you have any advice for, I don't know if either of you have experienced this, like if, you're, if you know you're going into the hospital or post like, uh, Advice, sorry. <laughs> Advice for like when you're coming out of the hospital, uh, this person said maybe post-surgery and you're living on your own, you don't have a partner, like what you do to be prepared to take care of yourself. You know, it's you don't have someone to bring you soup or change bandages or whatever else it might be. Um, do either of you have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean... 
for me, uh, because there was a period when kids weren't here, um, it was frankly uh, Uber Eats and grocery deliveries um, with easy to make things. You know, it's it wasn't the best budgetary choice and it probably wasn't the best dietary choice, but it's it's just kind of the way it needed to be. What about you, Jan? Anything you want to add to that? Well, I think that's a really good idea. Um, I would probably do the same thing, Darren. Um, and also right now, um, I have really, I have really good neighbors. Um, uh, and I, you know, would probably, I would probably reach out to them. Yeah. What I do, what I do is um, have all sorts of varieties of foods so that if my throat is really bad, I have soft things. Um, sometimes I keep things that are not good for me, but would make me psychologically feel a little bit better. Uh, and I do have a suitcase that's always ready in case I need to go, which has been twice in the last two days. Um, and it just makes me feel more secure that I have frozen food, fresh food, and things that I can open because when I'm really ill, some things are harder to open. So I have to prepare for that with knives, swearing, things that help. I apologize, I can't, I can't tell who is talking, but thank you for sharing that. It sounds like you've had a rough couple of days, so we're thinking of you, wrapping you in some care. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, anything else either of you want to add? Well, I mean, I, I guess I hadn't really thought of it in terms of connecting it this way, but I have taken to preparing slightly larger meals and sort of half of the freezer is stocked. And we don't have like a big chest freezer, just the one that's, you know, built into the fridge. Um, about half of that has like already cooked, ready mm -hmm. to go meals. And I, I hadn't made any kind of association that way, but maybe it was like a subconscious accommodation, just having that stuff there. So I do have that. I don't know why it's never occurred to me to have a little bag packed, but I'm going to do it now because that, that would be really great. And, you know, I mean, we all have the little travel toothpaste and stuff. I can just just be sitting here in a corner. So I, I'm going to do that. Well, that's why we're here. Thanks for the advice, Jan, to get some new ideas to support us. Um, and Jenny just wrote in the comments that uh, she recommends giving health keys to others in case you can't get to the door, but having someone who's prepared who could enter your house. Um, I like that idea too. Oh, I have done that. Yeah, my neighbors have the keys. And uh, when I'm on a job, um, because, because they change, uh, my there's always a three members of my staff, the assistant, they are, they have, I have house keys at the work, at the job, so that they, you know, have access to the case. Yeah, that's, good yeah. that's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, some, some, okay. city, some cities have uh, an organization that will uh, come out with a lock with your key in it, and um, the police will be called. So even if your door is locked or something, they can get in if you don't have anybody to help you out. Yeah, that's a great idea. I've heard that so they don't have to like break down the door or something like that. Right. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I guess to, to move to our, our next section, I, uh, and I know Darren, you're like, we, you wanted to prioritize this and I agree, self-care. Um, when you don't, you had said like, which I mentioned the example before, when you don't have a partner to bring you soup or give you a massage or whatever else it might be, um, how do you support yourself and, and uh, do nourishing things for you? So Darren, I'm gonna start with you there. Well, so I've had to learn a lot over the past couple of years. Um, you know, cause I, growing up uh, male in North America, in the 70s and 80s, you know, not a lot of learning about self-care, not a lot of learning about, you know, doing things for yourself. Um, and I had always prided myself. I, I was the guy that, you know, I was the guy that you called if you got your truck stuck in a ditch. I was the guy who called, you called 
if your tree fell down in your yard and you needed a chainsaw and somebody to help cut it up. Um, and, and I'm not that anymore. Um, so yeah, I've, I've had to learn to be very intentional. And for me, it's actually, it's a matter of scheduling or I won't do it. Uh, I have to kind of put it in my schedule to do things that are good for myself. Um, oftentimes that's, you know, um, we have a beautiful public garden near my workplace. So spending some time in the public gardens, just around the trees and birds and flowers for, you know, so many months of the year that we can do that. Um, I see people go for massages and they seem to really enjoy them, but I haven't been able to, to quite get there yet myself. And, uh, and hobbies, um, like I, I developed a couple of hobbies and they're just the greatest thing for that downtime when you need to focus on something other than work and other than disease, um, having some hobby. Uh, I can't speak highly enough of that. So I'm not the greatest example. Perhaps I'm an example of somebody who's learning and, and trying to figure it out. Um, but I know how much better I feel when I'm consistent and intentional about doing those things versus how crappy I feel if I ignore it. Mm, and I, I think that's, I love that you share that you're still learning because we all are, none of us are ever going to get it perfectly right and it's going to shift. And also how you said, you know, you don't go for massages, which for me, I'm like, oh my God, massage is the best thing ever. But I'm like, I love, I love that you're listening to what works for you. For everyone, it's going to be something different. And the point is that what you're drawn to. Um, before I go to you, Jan, I see Linda has her hand raised. Linda, do you want to share something? Uh, this is going to sound strange. But I listen to audiobooks by Stephen King because the characters in there are always having so many worse things than I am. <laughs> I can get outside my skin and just enjoy the craziness. <laughs> no, that, that makes sense, Linda. Yeah, a good audiobook that you can get lost in is wonderful. Um, what about you, Jan? Uh, what self care things do you do for yourself? I think for me, a lot of it revolves around um, being in some sort of nature, whether it's, you know, in my little, you know, patio garden, you know, where I live, or it's um, Descanso Gardens um, here in LA and Huntington Gardens have been two very important uh, places for me to heal um, because at each garden, because they're so vast, I could make a goal of, okay, I'm going to walk, you know, when I was having problems walking at first, you know, I can make it to the lilacs today, or, you know, I can go... So um, um, for me, that's, that's, that's a, you know, the ocean, you know, getting, you know, going to the beach and just hearing the birds and, you know, and taking a nap. I love taking naps. <laughs> no, it's important. I feel like sometimes we feel like we can't stop and take a nap. Um, but also just how you're talking about public spaces um, that, you know, if you are struggling to go very far or public spaces are free and open to everyone um, that depending on where you are in your journey and how much energy you have, there's still, um, you can hopefully find a little something to bring some joy into spaces that could feel dark at, at points. Um, anything either of you want to add about self-care before, or anything else before I, um, I know there are a couple of questions in the chat in the q and I think the only thing I would comment, and this is just the way it's worked out, is we're doing this at a time where I know that I'm feeling particularly good. And I think maybe, Jen, you're feeling pretty good these days too, you know, and, and that can give people kind of the wrong sense of where we're at because I have some pretty rotten times and this could have just as easily happened then. So, um, you know, I think we're just like everybody else who's attending today. You know, there are good times, there are bad times, and it's a struggle and we try to hold on to the little things that just pull us through to the next good time. Mm, yeah. Thank you for pointing out that out. And even the parts that are invisible that you might look better than you are. Or, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions that we have, and, and if anyone else has more, again, please put them in the Q and a box. Um, Sarah wants to know, is anyone aware of medical resources that help you coordinate between all your doctors for those of us that have 10 plus doctors, the medical administrative burden is huge. Uh, anyone, whether you're in the audience and want to put something in the chat or uh, Jan or Darren, if you know something 
like that? I don't have any answers and I agree. Um, you know, it can be a nightmare to try and get everyone talking to each other. Yeah. Um, and I've experienced that. I'm afraid I don't have any solution for that. Yeah, I think it's, um, and I'm sorry that we don't at this moment have an answer for you, Sarah. I think it's important that you're bringing it up and that we're talking about it. So much of sharing stories of people living with chronic illness or whatever it might be, I feel like the innovation can come from there, that the healthcare system, these are like invisible needs that people don't even know are important, except those who are living with a disease like, like vasculitis. So um, yeah, I don't know, maybe someone will take this and create an app or something <laughs> from here, um, but we, we need to keep sharing these stories to, to bring that up. So thank you, Sarah. Um, hopefully someone has something else for you. Um, we have a few more minutes and so far, I don't think any other questions, but so I, I have another question. Um, this is sort of tangential, but this is a flying solo group. So we've got singles in here. Anyone want to comment on, uh, dating advice with vasculitis, like how you talk to a potential partner uh, about your, your health? And I didn't ask you to, if we can talk about this in advance, you're welcome to both pass. <laughs> well, so I, I started dating somebody, we're, we're no longer dating, but I started dating somebody after my diagnosis. And um, I decided to be very open about it um, right from the get-go. And I even said, you know, this is a lot to take on. And if we just have this dinner and we go our separate ways, that's fine too. Um, but she decided to stick around. And in fairness to her, um, you know, she was a lovely woman, but the, the hard times were a little bit more than she was ready to take on. Mm -hmm. And, and that led to some issues between us. And we ended up parting amicably, like there's no ill will and we still kind of stay in touch a bit, but it, it is hard. Um, if I, if not, if I decided to, I'll make another foray back into the dating world, sure. Um, and I'll probably do the same thing again. Um, just sort of lay it out, not, not in sort of all the gory details, but but be pretty upfront about it and, and give them the option to bail um, right right away. Uh, yeah, that's so interesting, Darren. It sounds like bold choice. Your first dinner is when you shared. Yeah, well, you know, I didn't want to sort of get to like second or third or fourth <laughs> dinner and then sort of drop this bomb on them. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and and then, you know, have them questioning, you know, well, if he's not honest about this, what other things is right. that, you know, is, is there another secret girlfriend or does he have, you know, a bunch of other kids or yeah. yeah so that that's the way I decided to do it. And and I would do it again. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I wasn't trying to second guess it, just wanted to understand it for other people who might be going through that. Um, Jan, do you want to weigh in at all? <laughs> well, I love I love um what Darren did. I would I would do the same thing. I honestly have had zero interest in dating anyone for a while. <laughs> That's not to say that I, you know, now I'm feeling better. Um, that's something I'm, I'm more open to now. And and I would handle it the way Darren did. I think, you know, on the first date right now, you know, this is what's going on. I would do that. I think, I think honesty is the best. Mm -hmm. And just a, a plug for our Living Well with Vasculitis series, webinar series, we are hoping to have someone come and talk about dating uh, with chronic illness soon. So stay tuned. We're hoping that comes into being. Um, <laughs> Jennifer, fingers crossed. If anyone has anything else they want to add, you can, um, like a question, you can go ahead and just unmute yourself now. Um, just leave space for that for a moment. If not, we can... Wrap up. Hi, it's Judith, and I've unmuted myself. And it was really interesting hearing you guys talk about your employers. But um, you know, there's also the situation with someone like myself that's self-employed mm -hmm. with clients, and I'm walking a fine line of not wanting them to know so they don't think 
that I'm not capable to step up because I work in real estate. So I've got to be able to go up and down stairs and go and move. And I, you know, I've got bandages all over my legs and, you know, it's not a pretty picture. And so it's a really fine line of really trying to minimize it with them so that I continue to get referrals so that they don't think I'm not, can't handle it. It's really hard because that's my only source of income and I need it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a whole different game there when you're self-employed independent contractor. Yeah. I mean, I know Darren and Jan, that's not your situation. Anything you want to touch on there? Well, it kind of is. It kind of is mine because I am kind of an independent contractor. I work, Judith. I work in the film industry, so I you go from project to project, right? And and, and I totally relate a hundred percent with, you know, that, that you know at the beginning when I said you know I, I work in an industry where they expect you to be healthy and and you know going up and down the stairs and all that. So I t I totally get that. Um, and what I have done recently um just because you know we're in a work shutdown right now because of contracts going on so a lot of people are not working right now and so on uh on an instagram post i on rare disease day i came out with a just to eliminate gossip you know and just said you know i have you know vasculitis and this and i'm moving well now and da 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 and then just let it die that way um but it's not like I made an announcement at the studio or anything like that. So I empathize and I can relate to um, what you're what you're dealing with. I was hospitalized for four months in 2020 before the pandemic started in January, from January to May. And I didn't want anybody to know. I mean, I actually sold a house from a hospital bed. I just I didn't want anybody to know. And um uh then when the pandemic hit, I thought, well, I'm on an even playing field with everybody else. Everyone's on lockdown and I'm in the hospital. So good. But it was, uh, I kind of had that leeway during 2020. But the thing is, I still mask up because I'm suppressed, mm -hmm. like I'm sure a lot of you guys are. And depending on the scenario, I, I mask up. And um, every three weeks, every four weeks for a week, I get IVIG infusions at home six hours each day for a week. And I'm lucky enough to have a nurse that comes in the afternoon so I can schedule things for the morning. But it's still, I mean, I'm not running around doing caravan day, you know, which is when we go out and look at interview in, in, inventory like I used to, because I don't have the energy. I have to save it up for when I'm with people. So it's, it's really been a challenge to, and I, being with these wounds on my feet and legs where I can't even wear proper shoes, I have really gotten at it. I, I used to play tennis three times a week till this happened. And now I can't even wear tennis shoes and I've lost my conditioning and ability to walk distances. And so I feel I have to save it up for when I absolutely need it. And then I can recover afterwards. So for me, I've been struggling with living my life and supporting myself and on and on. Well, thank you for sharing. I'm sad to hear that it's been so hard and yet I'm sure there's oh. lots of people who can relate. So again, thank you for um, sharing that publicly. I think a couple of things, I mean, one, yeah, it seems like can't always predict when you're going to be able to do something or when you're not, which makes it hard to even plan. Um, someone with vasculitis said to me the other day, like, I don't ask too much from the future because I, I don't know how to plan. Um, and we have had for like webinars like this, we've asked other people to join us to share, you know, publicly like Jan and Darren are doing. And sometimes they'll say like, thank you, but no, because I, I don't want to be public with my employers. I don't want someone to discover that I have it. And we totally respect and understand that because it can be a fine line depending on where you're working, who your employer is, what your industry is, if they'll understand and you'll be able to continue to get work. And when you're flying solo, um, you need you need this job. This is your your source of income. I, I That was a lot of talking. I wish I had like a magic wand that I could just wave and, and fix it or provide some sort of answer for 
all of us. But again, thank you for sharing and making it public. Um, I'll take, I guess, one more question from Linda. Uh, have Darren or Jan, have you thought about end of life plans for um, when you are flying solo? Yeah, yeah, I have a, a living well, um, and I hope that, um, so the place I live is relatively small, particularly by American standards, but it's large by Canadian provincial standards, sort of. Um, but the hospital here is a teaching hospital with the university attached. Um, so I'm hoping that giving this to them <laughs> will will help further um, knowledge and understanding of, mm -hmm. of the disease. So that's that's my plan. Dan, anything you want to add? Uh, no, I have a living will. Well, thank you both. Um, and thank you everyone for participating, for sharing your stories, for asking your questions. Um, we really do appreciate all of you and especially Jan and Darren for having the, the courage and um, just the vulnerability to, to share publicly. Um, Jennifer, I believe my colleague is gonna follow up with an email with some more information and some tips for you, some like how to take action um, on some of the things we shared and some other things, resources. Um, but other than that, thank you and enjoy the rest of your, I don't know what day it is. You're all coming from different time zones. Oh, maybe it's <laughs> Tuesday for most of you, unless you're in Australia, <laughs> um, but thank you. Um, we'll hopefully see you soon.